Um, so I decided in the end that actually the title of this presentation was Hookland Exists to be Put on a Postcard. Um, and I'll explain, I'll explain why. So I need to say a really big thank you to Kenny and to Katie Saw for accepting my contribution for this session on the basis of uh, what they must have thought was quite frankly the strangest abstract that they'd ever received. Because it came through the post. It came through the post. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so Hookland exists to be put on a postcard. Um, my, my response to this call for papers is um, so a thing that I made, which I'll share with you and then I'll talk about. And I've realised now, hearing our first three papers this morning, that some of the things that David said um, must have been running through my mind because I'm going to talk about some of the things that David brought up and, and hopefully in the fact that I've, I've made some things, our, our other two speakers this morning, maybe... I'm not saying this will tie together some of the things that, that we've heard so far, but hopefully you'll see how it fits. I think it fits. I hope it does fit. Um, so greetings from Hookland. Um, here is a set of 11 postcards called Some Toadstones of England. So we've got a complete set here, which I'm going to hand round, and I'll take the wrapper off a second set so you can look at the individual cards. Um, if anybody would like a postcard as a souvenir of today, come and ask me about that. I've, I've got um, mostly the sets that I have are for other people, but I hope there, there, there'll be enough if some of you, not all of you, but if some of you did want a postcard, you, you could have one. So I'm going to start this, this whole set here. If you keep this in the wrapper, please. And then, Kenny, can, can we still help send these around the room? So there are 11 for you to take a look at. Um, you'll see that each postco postcard is about a different toadstone or appearance of the toad in archaeology or in geology. Um, and this piece of work, for me, it's about the archaeological and geological imagination. And it follows on from an archaeological comic of mine, which is called The Toadstones, um, the, 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 sorry, the, um, the Tale of the Toadstone. If you Google the tale of the toadstone, you'll probably stumble across the comic if you wanted to have to have a look. Um, so recently online in the interview, David commented that given enough time, everything you create, everything you value becomes ephemera. So here is some Hookland ephemera. I used the first po postcard. This is this is the first postcard. I used this as my abstract for this session. And at the time, I only had the one copy, so I posted that to Kenny. But I've since been able to collect, as you see as they come around, I've since been able to collect all 11 uh, copies of all 11 postcards that make this set some toadstones of England. And you'll see that all were written, uh, all were written on by different people and either mailed or hand delivered or hand collected by different recipients. So before I go any further, you should know that Hookland has a toadstone. Um, I've circled it on the map. It's at the bottom left hand corner of the map in the little red circle. Hopefully you can just about read. It says the toadstone. But this topographical feature isn't unique to this county. It's not unique to Hookland. There are numerous toadstones around the world. And one of them is really close to my heart. And many others have been shared with me by correspondents in my kind of latter day antiquarian community. Um, so while the postcards go round, I'll, I'll show you them as well. Briefly though, briefly. So this is my toadstone. This is the toadstone that I know. It's the Fifield toadstone. It's in Wiltshire. It's a sarsen stone thought by archaeologist A.D. Passmore to have been abandoned en route to the stone circles at Avebury. And this is its cousin, Toad Rock. This is at Rustall in Tunbridge Wells. Um, this was introduced to me by, by Dr. Matthew Pope. And as you can see, it's a dangerous monument that's kept behind bars, <laughs> like so many of our, of our dangerous monuments. Um, they have a sister. This is Toad Mouth at Hathersage in Derbyshire. This is one of the many waypoints for expeditioners on the moors. And this is the Skendleby toad. This was referenced to me by my friend, Dr. Anne Tether. It's a clay model that was excavated from a Bronze Age hearth in the ditch of a Neolithic long mound. 
And I first saw this kind of toadstone, which is set in a ring in the Cheapside Hoard, which is in the British Museum. This is a health preserving jewel taken from the head of a living toad that protects the wearer from poison. And it's a very strange, a very strange beast, this. The toad has to be living and it has like a jelly in its head. And if you can take that out while the toad is living, you will be able to get hold of that jelly and it, it solidifies, it turns into the stone and then you can set it like this in jewellery. And the Cheapside Hoard has examples set in uh, precious metals and also the stones, individual stones themselves. This is Olo de Sapo. It was uh, shown me by Dr. Ruth Siddle, who is a geologist. She's based here at UCL. This is the toad's eye stone that looks back at you when you break it open. And, uh, and Dr. Siddle also wrote to me about Derbyshire's other toad stone. This is Tortstein or Taud stone, um, which despite being many millions of years older, has many affinities with Fifield's sarsen stone. Um, the, the, one in, uh, the one in Wiltshire. And this is an example, I hope you can, you can see, it's a difficult photograph, this, um, for, the, uh, for the author to, to capture. So this is an example of an infamous toad in a hole. This is another of, another of Dr. Pope's findings. One of, these, one of these, in fact, a famous example of this is a, a popular exhibit at the Booth Museum in Brighton, isn't it just? Yeah, it's, and it's amazing. <coughs> um, and then in the 10th in the post, postcard is about this, the, this sort of toady charnel house in the Hanford Spur flint mine of Hambledon Hill in Dorset, where there was something like 60 or so toads that tried to overwinter in these human-made hollows uh, in the chalk. And then the last postcode, uh, postcard, the, um, <clears throat> the Down Farm toad. This was found by my former supervisor, Dr. Tony Legg, in a cow's skull. The skull had been placed in an open grooved ware pit and for the toad the skull made a welcome home uh, but eventually a coffin. So there's a long-standing relationship between people and toads and I, I promise this wasn't planned in advance but just to be clear Hookland really does have souvenir postcards and Hookland, Hookland exists on postcards. This was um, a, a recent tweet from the Hookland Guide uh, account. Um, so to toadstones, you'll get an idea from the postcards of, of what toadstones look like and what they can be. They're the, project, they're the products of, of archaeological, geological, technological, medico-folkloric, topological, topographical, choreographical, cartographical, whatever, imaginations. And they're made through, I think they're made through our engagement with worldly materials, with the bones, the stones, the fossils that they're, that they're made of. They're made through personal experience of one sort or another, and they've been imaginatively brought to life. So I think it's important to acknowledge that geology and archaeology have been created through imagination, and in particular, that they use visual thinking. So if you bring to mind the geological succession, part of which is on the screen in the slide, or archaeological time depth, these are largely unseen things, which you have to find a way of your, of your own for seeing. You have to use your imagination to bring to mind. And we can depict those things visually. So that made me think about how speaking and writing and drawing are forms of mental imagination um, that use varied types of marks on a page. Postcards <coughs> also make use of multiple forms of mental imagination. Postcards are object, they're text, they're image, but it's not simply the image that matters. They have material properties and the networked nature of the made and sent postcard are things that archaeology has the means to attend to. And as archaeology and geology are composed of poetic ideas, so an artist's postcard is an opportunity to express a poetic idea. So I think a postcard is a really useful medium for archaeology and for geology. Um, Michael Tausig would say that imagination and documentation coexist in a drawing. I would add that imagination and documentation coexist in a postcard. They have conventions which invite play, as in the postcard art of Anwell Cooper Willis, for example. And postcards are also cheap, they're simple, they're personal. Artists' postcards have been used as a kind of anti-art establishment, anti-unaffordability position. 
And that, for me, res resonates with certain strands in public archaeology. <laughs> so I think a postcard is a really useful medium for archaeology and for geology. But what if postcards document an imagined place? If Hookland has geology and archaeology, then it has tourists. If it had tourists, it needs postcards. Postcards play a role in creating a place, a site, a mood, beliefs, perceptions and knowledge. Our holiday postcards are like those artist postcards that were made to commemorate happenings and other ephemeral artistic events, communicating in the present day something of what it may have felt like to be there at the time. So what was it like to be there? What's it like to be here in Hookland? Postcards are a kind of evidence. So I think a postcard is a really useful medium for archaeology and for geology. So each of my postcards in this set is a kind of portrait. Just like postcards of prehistoric monuments are portraits, my postcards of toadstones are portraits. True, they are composed, <coughs> but as portraits they have the potential to disclose or reveal something of their subjects. But these witnesses are only partially formed. Most postcards, after all, are co-produced by the manufacturer and by the sender at the very least. Postcards share some of the strengths of comics in their integration of image and text. And that interplay is augmented by the tactility, by handling, by swapping and sending and interchange, by display, posting them up at home. And there is an empty space on the back of the postcard behind the picture, which is available if you want to use it for an intervention. So with that in mind, think about your answer to this fundamental question for geology and for archaeology. What are the implications of reconstructing a past that no one has ever seen? And while you think about that, look at these dinosaurs from Crystal Palace on the screen. <laughs> <coughs> to put it another way, you could ask, what does the hookland we create say about us? So Michael Shank says that archaeological imagination is a creative impulse and a faculty at the heart of archaeology, which is rooted in something that he calls archaeological sensibility, a pervasive set of attitudes towards traces and remains. So how do we learn those attitudes? And where does that sensibility come from? Well, we know the implications of reconstructing a past that no one has ever seen using this imagination this sensibility, there are colonial, powerful, partial and exploitative implications for both archaeology and for geology. Benin bronzes and Mongolian T-Rex skeletons alike are found in museums of the global north where they do not benefit the communities that they were taken from. It should be no surprise that the British Museum used Simon Cutts's postcard, which is the one on the screen on the front of the book, the world exists to be put on a postcard, to headline its recent exhibition of artists' postcards. The British Museum, an institution of empire that claims to be the Universal Museum, a museum that has put a lot of the world on a lot of postcards. So I see a further, oh dear, there we go. So, so I see a further affordance of the postcard for the imaginative recreation of geology and archeology. span If you can transform your or someone else's experience you can change the world. So use the postcard's empty space. Things have been different and they can be different. So use the postcard's empty space. Next time you visit Hookland's toadstone, use the postcard's empty space. And next time you write archaeology, use the postcard's empty space. And I'm just going to finish at that point. Thank you. Thank you.